My name is Tanner Madsen. I am a PhD student at the University of Connecticut. I study Lepidoptera life history and systematics. And this is my partner, Stephen Herrick, uh, who studies nuclear engineering at Three Rivers Community College. And our product is the Matson Trap. Now, I initiated the concept and design behind this trap, but it was really Stephen and his technical expertise that made it a reality. So the Matson Trap keeps in tradition with nocturnal insect collecting in that we seek to bolster the holdings and in institutional collections for scientific research, catalog new species, track distributional changes, monitor for invasive pests, and really sort of enhance course experience in, in entomology classrooms. And so this is born out of necessity like um, a, a lot of s inventions. And that was two years ago, I was sampling for um, insects in a Connecticut sand plain. And I was lugging around these traditional bucket traps um, where I was trying, I was doing environmental consulting, trying to lug these in the back of my Toyota Camry. And I had three of them. Uh, it was not size efficient, and it was sort of logistically difficult. You can see that they ran off of a, uh, a large car battery. At the same time, I was going out west to do some research in the American Southwest. And you can't transport these easily, so you had to ship them. You had to get batteries when you were there. It was just uh, logistically difficult, so I thought, there's got to be a better solution. And so I started experimenting with LED lights so I could reduce the power source. And so with that, I 3D printed a bucket trap that is space efficient, cost effective, and now transportable. So the first, the base, is what you see there. There's a small hole there for where the rain drain, which I'll show you in a bit, will insert. Um, the second piece here screws in. And this is uh, sort of an insect screen to prevent large insects from destroying smaller insects as they come into the trap. And then the large holes are where a scintillation vial with a wick, um, wicks ethyl acetate um, as a kill trap. You can also run this as a live trap if you would like. So there's three holes for the scintillation vials. Then we have the rain drain piece right here, which inserts in the middle, because lots of times water will get into your trap, ruin your samples. The top piece screws in here. And then finally, sort of the, uh, the business piece, which is where the LED lights are incorporated in the top. So turn this on, and you can see maybe the LED lights that are incorporated in the top. OK, so sort of issues in the competition. Um, traditional bucket traps are two to three feet tall. You're looking at like 30 to 60 pounds lugging around. So it really prevents you from getting out into um, habitat. They're between $180 to $500. And because of inefficient lighting technology, um, they uh, uh, require very large batteries and that are not approved to, to fly with. Like you can't travel uh, uh, via, via airplanes. And then this makes standardization of insect trapping difficult if you want to do ecological or biodiversity studies. So the, our solution, the Matson Trap, is cost effective. I believe I could be able to sell these between 25 and 40 bucks, um, and then about $25 or so for the batteries. Um, it is 35 times smaller and 40 times, or 40 times smaller and 35 times lighter then uh, sort of a competitor at, at lep traps. And then, and then this is, you can, I've, I had one of these in my check-in and one in my carry-on on my way here. So they go right through TSA. And then it's been effective in five US states and Mexico this summer prototypes. This is one trap sampling night in Arizona. Um, and so our market, uh, really I just want to seek to uh, free the collector to, to sample in remote and inaccessible regions. I've been, uh, have interested in uh, parties from the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, the Canadian Forest Service, the US Department of Agriculture that look to monitor invasive pests with this, environmental consulting, looking at rare and endangered species, education. I believe that this can be placed and really given its cost in the hands of about every entomology student across the world to enhance the course um, experience. And then finally, uh, uh, entomology is built on a foundation of avocational collectors and, and non-professional non uh, scientists. And so uh, the sort of the cost-effective nature of this allows that to continue. Uh, and so with that, I'll take questions uh, from the audience and the judges.
Um, so, just to start, this is this is very early. I just, I mean, I just invented this thing this summer and then took it out into the field uh, with me. It was it was very effective, um, but but so I haven't gotten very far down this road. Now, as far as marketing, I'd like to develop a website where I could um, sell these through, but I'm also not averse to um, using existing distributional pathways like selling through BioQuip for instance, um, if, if they were to, uh, uh, to partner with me in that. Uh, so uh, that's really the, the infrastructure that they have at the moment. And, um, um, and then there's also word of mouth. I mean, we're, as entomologists, we're connected all over the world to a lot of people. So. Um, can you talk a little bit about your, the iterations you've gone through so far, or the first prototype? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so originally, I started experimenting with the LED lights. And if I back up here to the traditional sort of Leroy Kane style trap, I got a wooden dowel from the lumber yard and, and strung these LED light strips around it and just placed it inside. Because then I could really get away from that large car battery and I could look at you know, the difference. And I was amazed at how effective these cheap LED light strips were. And so I ran them side by side. They were, uh, they were about the same. Um, and then from there, I started experimenting with 3D printing because, like, if I can reduce the light, now I can reduce the trap. And um, I've been, this is my fifth iteration, I believe. Um, I'm using ABS plastic instead of PLA. The PLA run on, this, on a cheap printing 3D printer was a little splintery. So you know, there's a lot of uh, modifications that have been made. Um, originally, I had the light sort of scaffolded up on the top, um, and then I figured out I could incorporate it into the actual rim of the funnel, and it's, it's been really effective. Because this is 3D printed, is it something, so let's say that you have something out in the field, and I break apart, I break one of the rings. Is this something where the person who owns the trap would have to contact you to get another ring, or could they also get the plans to 3D print the piece themselves. Right, yeah, and that's something I've been sort of debating is whether I want to, to just give the, the CAD drawings away. Um, and and one, of these, one of the reasons I kind of don't is because I want this to sort of serve as a standardized trap and then in the age of insect decline, we want standardization in our ecological and biodiversity studies. And if I give the CAD drawings away, someone's just gonna modify it and then we might not have that, that standardization, so. Um, I'm still mulling over, over that, but you would definitely be allowed to, to, to order a single piece and not the entirety of the trap. Okay, I'm wondering which insect order this trap would be most effective at yeah. collecting, and I also need to be from the context of how small to how big. Yep. And then the other question is, um, based on the size, questions. Uh, so you're going to get sort of a, your main nocturnal uh, insect orders. You're going to get Lepidoptera, Coleoptera, Hymenoptera, and Diptera are going to be your main, main ones. Um, I'm a Lepidopterist, so you know, I sort of uh, focus. I, I tried to, it applies to all those orders, but I'm seeking the Lepidoptera. Um, as far as, uh, uh, sorry, can you repeat your second question? The second question was about the volume that yeah. the container can hold. Sure. Sure. So I have, I have not filled it up yet, um, but I, I am sure that this will be filled up uh, on a good night in the tropics. And so I'm, I'm sort of uncertain at this point as to uh, what will happen. But one thing I do know is because this is such a small container, the ethyl acetate that's wicking in there, uh, you know, volatilizing is very strong. It knocks them out very quickly. So I suspect that the moths within will stay, um, stay dead or, or incapacitated and then uh, no, once it, the, the bottom fills up, there'll be no longer anything coming in. Another solution is that these can be ran off timers pretty easily. I could incorporate a timer or a light sensor 
um, which would, uh, you know, you could shut it off after two, year, two hours of running, for instance. Uh, two questions as a, as a collector. Uh, can you vary the lights uh, that are in there to get different wavelengths? Uh, and also, does the ethyl acetate interact with the plastic? Because that's a problem in uh, yep, some plastics. Yep, good question. Yes, um, I'll answer the second one first. Uh, the ethyl acetate does react with the plastic. Um, it does with, as it does with most plastics. Um, and I've spilt it, and it, it will sort of um, stain it. If you had repetitive dropping onto it, um, I, I think that, yeah, you'd probably put a hole in the plastic. Um, but these, these are in these scintillation vials. They're, the gas, the, the liquid is, it's very stable inside there. It should not escape unless you're careless. And then also, one thing that's nice about the scintillation vials, you can unscrew the top and put a normal cap on that doesn't have the hole with the wick in it and then just bust it out and you don't have to breathe ethyl acetate like, like I've had to do before with sponges that are wicking. Um, uh, and, then, uh, and then your other question, um, I'm sorry, it's, it's, you, you guys stacking questions on me, I can't, can't remember. No, the, um, the different kinds of yeah. lights you have in the strips there. Right, right, so, so um, you can order different wavelength lights uh, online with these LED light strips. This one is operating between 395 and 405 nanometers. Um, uh, optimal, you know, mo most insects are gonna be in that UV spectrum range. I would like to sort of shift that more towards UV um, than the lights I'm using now, but they're really easy to interchange. I just, you know, I just sort of take my fingers like this and I can ring them out and replace them. And the lights themselves are very inexpensive. So um, I will be sort of, in, in the next, this next summer, I'm seeking to gather a lot of data on this comparative to traditional traps, as well as um, using different uh, colored lights and, and spectra. Uh, to, to figure out uh, what's best. But then by spring 2021, uh, I would like to have it available for anybody to use. I, I mean, uh, I'll just, can I make a comment then? I mean, it, one thing is, is that you might not hear enough is that we, I, I believe we're not collecting enough um, we need to be out there collecting in, in, in accessible and remote areas um, where, uh, where we can get these species before they're lost and get them in collections. And so I think this will really help in, in that endeavor. Did you have another question? Yeah, I had one more question. So uh, this is multiple pieces that screw together quite, sure. quite readily. What is the transportable form of this? Oh. You unscrew it and collapse it? So it's, it's I, even, even more complex. I'm glad you asked. Let me show you. Okay. So, you know, this was all in an effort for space efficiency. So that played into how it gets put together. So the bottom piece will nest within the middle piece. This middle piece will nest within the top piece. You can screw the funnel part on and the rain drain will just go into the top like this. It breaks down to four by six inches, four inches tall, six inches wide, which is way better than three feet tall and an inch and a half across or a foot and a half across, excuse me. Do we have time for any more questions? Runs off these tiny lithium ion batteries. Um, this one will run it for 12 hours. This one will run it for 24 hours. Uh, quick question, over here, over here. Quick question, uh, deployment in the field. Is that thing on the ground, on the post? Uh, an yeah. effective radius of that light that comes out of it. Yeah, there. yeah, so um, I'm, I'm unsure of the effective radius. It doesn't have the same power as your 15 watt uh, tube bulbs, but it's getting much of the abundance and most of the diversity. Um, uh, it's, you, but you make up for that. You could dispense six of these for the price of, well, above to 10 of these for the price of one of those, as well as you know, really increase your sampling range. Uh, and, and so uh, I do have a lot of work. Uh, so like this next summer is the push to get a lot of this empirical data that I don't have at the moment. Right now, all I have, well, I got this to show you, which is that it's been super effective for me with prototypes. And where was it sitting on the ground? Oh, or yeah, and, and, and so when I was in Mexico, I had a lot of sandy substrates. I could just sort of nestle it in, but I sent it just right on the, right on the soil. Now one time, I did have a, 
like a skunk or a raccoon bother it and knock it over because it is really lightweight. Um, and the batteries themselves, everything within this is waterproof. The batteries themselves are not. I just put them in a sandwich bag uh, that prevents water from getting in. Um, and if, as you know, I'm speaking mostly from as a lepidoptera, uh, lepidopterist perspective, but as a coleopterist, you could just as easily put ethanol on the bottom of this instead of using ethyl acetate. Thank you.